this webinar. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this Whole Person Education Academy webinar series on integrating whole person education and online environment. This webinar is presented to you by five leading private universities in Indonesia, which are very concerned with whole person education. They are Universitas Kristen Satyawacana Salatiga, Sanata Dharma University Yogyakarta, Petra Christian University Surabaya, Maranatha Christian University Bandung, and Duta Wacana Christian University Yogyakarta. This webinar series are also made possible with the support of the United Board for Christian Higher Education in Asia, and Ateneo de Manila University, Philippines. The webinar series will be held twice, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the first one with the topic of student formation through online environment. And next week with the topic of the design of online environment for teaching and learning during and after COVID-19. Now allow me to greet directly and personally our three keynote speakers for today. And uh, good morning, Dr. Go, Dr. Eka, and Dr. Aditya. And also my greeting to the representatives of UBCHEA, um, I got Dr. Hope Anthony as the Director for Faculty Development, and then Dr. Angela Wong Wai Ching, the United Board Vice President for Program, and Anne Fallon MA as UB Communication Consultant. Excuse me if I cannot mention the other uh, honorable representatives from UB who supported uh, this webinar very uh, greatly, but very happy to have you all here. And I would also like to greet directly the whole committee who have been working so hard and so passionately to bring this webinar uh, online for the participants. And of course, my wholeheartedly uh, greeting too to all the participants in Zoom platform here and also the YouTube channel. I'm Megawati from Dutawacana Christian University. We'll be facilitating this webinar as the master of ceremony and moderator. Now let's start, ladies and gentlemen, with the first agenda. We are going to have the opening remark from the representative of the committee. Let us welcome Dr. Audate Daena from Sanata Dharma University for the opening remarks. Dr. Auda, the time for opening remark is yours. He needs to be unmuted. Dear committee. Okay. Everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay, good. Yes. So Good morning, everyone, and again, welcome to the uh, program. So, as Pumika already mentioned, that this program was uh, initiated by uh, five universities in Indonesia that has just been uh, mentioned previously. So, um, Uka Petra, Uka Maranata, Uka SW, Uka Dewi, and 
Sanata Dharma University, USD. Um, and I think we owe a great deal to uh, Ibu Debi or Miss Debi. She's the uh, leader of this, of this group. She uh, contacted us, the alumni of uh, Whole Person Education Academy. And then we, we talk about uh, what we can do during this um, pandemic. So we end up with this um, program, the webinar senior series, there are two. Um, and we believe that uh, these five universities and also everyone in this uh, webinar um, has a common belief that higher education should foster uh, young people to grow um, academically, but also spiritually. So that is more or less what we believe about um, education. Um, this is also, uh, this pandemic is a kind of um, uh, good and bad thing. Later we will be listening to um, Father Jonico, um, Paika, and also Padetia will be sharing about, you know, um, what is good and what is, uh, well, not, not very good, but it's, it's kind of, uh, can we find something in it? So we will uh, be discussing that, sharing that together, because uh, we as people, uh, professional educators, and also institutions uh, should always review and reflect about our practice, our work, our mission, so that we will serve our students better. We can serve uh, young people uh, better. That is why we have this uh, webinar series. And um, we would like to express our gratitude to the speakers, Father Joniko, Dr. Eka Priyatma, and also Dr. Aditya. And also um, special appreciations to uh, United Board, especially to Dr. Hope Anton, who support us wholeheartedly. And also um, UP team, we have um, Dr. Angela Wong, Wai Ching, An Pelan, um, Anna Law, and also I, I think um, uh, Ricky Cheng was also with us today. So um, again, we hope that we can reflect we can uh, discern, we can learn from this um, pandemic so that we can serve um, students, we can serve young people better. So again, thank you very much for everyone joining this program. And we do hope that you learn something from the program and also enjoy the program. Thank you, Pumika. <laughs> thank you, Pa Oda or Dr. Oda for the opening for the opening remark that sets the warm atmosphere for our webinar now we will continue ladies and gentlemen with the photo taking so start with uh, start your video and give your best smile mr ryan from the committee will take several shots to make sure that all of our pictures are taken so maybe yes, we need to give our also creative pose like what Paoda already <laughs> gave as an example. <laughs> Is okay. that all? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mas Ryan. Yeah, we have here around 152 in Zoom and I don't have any information how many people are there in the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for the photo together. And I'm going to continue with two announcements to make before going on with our main agenda for this webinar. The first, is about the QA session. After three, uh, after three keynote speakers later, there will be a question and answer session for 20 minutes. You can write your question in the Zoom or YouTube uh, chat box, live chat, using this format. 
Yes. You mention your name, underscore your home institution or country, underscore the name of the speaker that you ask, underscore your question. Please make sure that you ask maximum two relevant questions to the topic. And the second announcement relates to the exit ticket link. So at the end of this webinar, the link to exit ticket will be given in a chat box and the screen for you later to submit at the latest at 4 p.m. Western Indonesia time or 5 p.m. Manila, Hong Kong time. Your exit ticket will allow you to get e-certificate automatically from the committee. So keep uh, being with us for the whole webinar. Let us now proceed with the first session on student formation through online environment presented by Father Johnny C. Go as JEDD. Uh, Dr. Go or Father Johnny, affectionately uh, addressed have graduated from Ateneo de Manila, both for undergraduate and MA degrees. There are two MA degrees that uh, he got in philosophy and theology, and two doctorate uh, degrees from University uh, College of London and Nanyang Technological University. This uh, doctoral degree is in education. And right now, Dr. Uh, Go is the global assistant for the mission and identity of Jesuit schools, International Secretariat for Jesuit secondary and post-secondary education. And he's also the director in Ateneo de Manila Institute for the Science and Art of Learning and Teaching, uh, shortened by SALT. And he is also the coordinator for programs of the Asia Pacific Network of Jesuit Schools, Jesuit Conference of Asia Pacific Education Secretary for Asia Pacific. Some seminars, talks, or workshops given include, but not limited to, we have received a 13-page uh, CV, ladies and gentlemen, so this might be a little uh, representative of the whole. The topics covered uh, include the Ministry of Teaching and then Learning by Refraction, Ignatian Pedagogy, Integrating Christian Values to Teach Gen Z Teens, and Principle and Foundation of Jesuit Education. Now, are you ready to learn from Father Johnny or Dr. Go? Yes, of course. So let us give our round applause to welcome Dr. Go. Dr. Go, the time is yours. Good morning, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to have been invited to this webinar. You know? And I'd like to say hello to all my friends in Indonesia. So the topic I was asked to share with you about today is online student formation. No? Uh, as we know, for our universities, uh, student formation is very important. No? So just as we are preparing how to offer classes, no? how to offer our academic programs to our students in an online environment, 
we must not forget that we are also being asked to make sure we offer online student formation. No? For most of our universities, I think this diagram captures our mission. No? There are three very important elements. Academic excellence is certainly an important ingredient in the mission and vision of our universities, but also faith and values formation, which is just as important, if not more important, some people will say, no? Because if you have a very competent person, but the character is flawed, that person will be a very dangerous person, as we are seeing in some of, some many examples all over the world today, you know? And also, I think the third element is we want our students to use their academic excellence and their faith and values formation to serve other people, especially those who are in greatest need. No? But before I talk about online student formation, I just want to talk about our context, no? our world today. And obviously, we are all trying to figure out no? this global pandemic. No? And it has very different implications on ourselves as educators, on ourselves as persons, but also very importantly on our students. No? For example, uh, as we know, our students are young people and more than us who are adults, I think young people have very strong social needs. No? And yet the global pandemic has asked them to distance themselves socially. No? They are unable to see their friends. We all know that one of the most important motivations our students have in coming to school, aside from learning, is really being with their friends. No? So this social deprivation that our students are experiencing is very important. No? As we are designing our academic programs and also our formation programs, we have to keep this in mind that this is the context no? of our students today, you know, as well as ourselves, okay? Also, according to psychologists all over the world, maybe we don't notice it. Maybe we're still studying and working from home as hard as we can, no? But in general, one effect of this global pandemic is a lowering of everyone's energy level, no? We are all low back now, especially our students, no? So again, as we are designing our programs, whether it's academic and formation, we must keep this in mind, no? that our students, just like their teachers ourselves, no? we have lower energy level. No? And we have to be acknowledging this. We cannot deny this. No? Because many of us still expect ourselves to be super productive, just like before the global pandemic. No? But there's a difference between being active and being productive. No? Being active is important. Being active during this global pandemic, according to psychologists, is very healthy. No? We should not just hide in our beds and get depressed all day. We must be active. No? But it doesn't mean we should expect the same level of productivity, just like during the old normal. No? If we are not as productive as before, that is okay. That is okay. If we demand the same level of productivity, we might get ourselves into trouble no? psychologically. So again, we have to think about this when we're designing the formation program and academic programs of our students. The other context no, for ourselves and for our students is access. No? It's very easy for the first world country to talk about online learning and online formation. No? But for us in the Philippines and maybe in Indonesia, Access is not something we can take for granted. So whenever we are designing an online academic or formation program, we must always think of being inclusive. No? We cannot exclude any student. No? We must make every effort no? to make sure that everyone is included. No? We must always think of the students in our class with the weakest link, with the most limited access. No? Otherwise, our formation program is not effective because we are not walking the talk. We are not practicing what we preach, which is to be inclusive. No? Okay, so um, 
so obviously this pandemic is a crisis and in Chinese the phrase for this is wei qi, no? But very interestingly, this Chinese phrase wei qi is made up of two other phrases, no? Wei xian, which is danger, which is which a crisis we know is dangerous, no? But the second character qi is from qi hui, which means opportunity. So as educators, we are beginning to we're trying to embrace this crisis is an opportunity. So I'd like to say that perhaps when we talk about online formation for our students, we should also think about the opportunity part, the opportunity dimension of providing online formation for our students. No? But first, I want to ask you, you know, let's examine our underlying assumptions you know, about online learning and online formation. Just like an iceberg, you know, the, our underlying formation assumptions form the more important part because we cannot do a good job unless we are sure our assumptions are in line with what we're trying to do. So let me ask you a question. Do you think online formation is worse or better than face-to-face -face formation? Can you type it in the chat box? You can put worse or better or whatever your answer is. Can you all try to do that now? I'll give you one minute to do that. So just type worse or better, no? So can we try to do that? Okay. Okay, so there's no, con there's no clear consensus. Some people say it's worse. Some people say it's better. And some people say uh, both, no? And of course the answer is, it depends, no? It depends. Because just because something is online, or just because something is face-to-face -face doesn't mean it's better. No? It's not about delivery. No? It's about design. It depends on how you design it. No? So even if you have face-to-face -face formation, but if the design is awful, it's worse. No? If you are online, if your design is bad, it's going to be worse. No? But if you are online, but your design is good, if your design is effective, your online formation, just like your online academic program, can be better. So my dear educators, the crucial factor is not whether you're online or face-to-face. -face. The crucial factor is the way we design our academic and especially our formation program. No? So um, a lot of people say, oh, but when it's virtual, it's not real. It's not as real as face-to-face. I would like to disagree with that, no? Uh, virtual can be very real because virtual means, because when something is effective, it is real. So if your online design program is effective, if it makes a difference, then it's real. No? So virtual is okay, no? Secondly, some people say vicarious is not as good as direct, no? It's better for the students to experience something directly rather than to experience it vicariously. But again, I would like to contest that, no? We don't have to experience everything directly. Sometimes we read a story, a very moving story, or we watch a movie, it can change our lives. No? It can be very effective, no? And third, some people say it's better to be up close and personal, no? But I'm saying that the online opportunities for us is to become more vast, no? to be able to reach more people. No? And that can also be a good thing. No? I'll go back to what I call the three Vs later. No? By the three Vs, I mean virtual, vicarious, and vast. But the big idea that I want to relate to you, my dear educators and formators, is that if we go online with our formation program, it's an opportunity to be more virtual, it's an opportunity to be more vicarious and it's an opportunity to be more vast, no? to reach more people. And these three Vs are very promising. They can make our formation programs more effective. No? So let me talk to you a little bit about that given the time that I have. No? So first, when we talk about formation programs, just like our academic programs, we should have formation outcomes. No? And it's important to be explicit it's important to be clear what our formation outcomes are. And where do we look 
all we have to do is look at the vision and mission statement of our universities, okay? So I'm sure all of our universities have beautiful vision and mission statements, no? But they're poetic, no? They're philosophical, but that's not useful. It's important for you to unpack your vision mission statement, no? Operationalize what your formation outcomes are. What do you want your graduates to be like by the time they graduate from your university, no? in terms of values, in terms of personal qualities. No? If you haven't written it down yet in your universities, I think that's step number one. Before you even think of any formation program, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, it's important to be explicit about your formation outcomes. And one way to do that is to look at your vision and mission statement. So what should a graduate be like by the time the graduate graduates from your universities? The more explicit it is, the better it will be for you. you know? So that's my first big idea. You know? Define the formation outcomes. What will be the goals of your formation program? Now, here's a clue. Usually when we talk about formation, we're talking about faith. We're talking about values. We're talking about service. So one way to define your formation program or to evaluate no, what formation outcomes you already have is to ask yourself, what is explicit about the faith of the graduate? What do we want to happen to the faith of the graduate when the graduate finishes studying in our university? What do we want our graduates to have in terms of values by the time they graduate from the university? And what do we want our graduates to do in terms of service to the country and to the poor by the time they graduate to the university? So I'd like to invite you, maybe after this webinar, to check your formation outcomes. Come up with three big outcomes, only three. No? Don't come up with 200, that's too hard. No? Only three. Three, one for faith, one for values, and one for service. I think if you're able to do this, the design of your formation program, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, will become better because you will be clearer about what you're aiming for, what you're designing for, okay? So next, let me talk to you a little bit about faith. What are some of the opportunities in online? No? So we want to teach faith to our students. I don't know what your experience is, no? but in the Philippines, we are largely Christians country, no? but it's very hard to form our students in their faith because their real religion is secularity. No? Because of uh, modernization, development, because of the internet, no? our students say they're Christian, but their real religion is secularism. No? Their values are affected by the world, not so much by scripture, not so much by the teachings of the church. I don't know what your experience is with your students, no? but it's important, I think, for us to look at the context. No? And the Philippines, this is our context. So we cannot say, oh, we've done our job in the faith because most of our students are baptized Christian. Yes, maybe they're baptized, but are they living out the faith? I don't know. No? So, um, I think there are some opportunities, no? Our students have doubts and questions about their faith. No? No? And they're all seekers. They're searching for meaning in their lives. No? I think whether they're, not, whether they're religious or not, they're searching for meaning in their lives. And we who are Christians, we who are believers, we believe that the religion, our faith, can provide some answers to the meaning of life. So this is an opportunity for us because when we go online, no, we can stop ourselves from telling them what they should believe. Maybe this is a good way for us to ask them about their questions and meet them where they are. Hopefully we can meet them where they are, not so much that we will follow them, but so, so that they can follow us. So we can lead them to the faith. No? So. It's a different way of evangelization. No? 
usually face to face we have our traditional way we tell them no what they should believe but now because it's online it's slightly different maybe we can make use of the environment to ask them what their questions are what are they looking for no so it's a different kind of approach it's a different kind of strategy no at the same time maybe we can use our online program to help slow them down and quiet them down no uh people are always in the rush people are always distracted no all of us who are using technology all of us have what they call a distraction sickness no all of us are adhd already because of the internet no so maybe the way we design our program we should give them not so much prayers with so many words no but prayers that quiet them down and slow them down no because you see one blogger andrew sullivan wrote in his blog what is killing faith today is not science no science has not been able to prove that god does not exist and science will not be able to do that what is killing our faith is the noise all the distractions no that we are subjected to so in our faith formation programs online no we have to make sure we give our students spaces for quieting down and slowing down okay what about values no what about values how can we teach our students values no and it's very similar to faith formation we cannot really rely anymore on the traditional way which is telling them what their faith should be or what their value should be so i have a question to ask you when you teach about faith when you teach about values do you teach them as facts do you teach them as opinion or do you teach them as judgment let me explain a little bit what they mean no when you teach something as fact for example jesus is our savior no when you tell your students this is a fact no you're telling them to just shut up and accept it they don't have to think about it they don't have to do anything just accept what the authority the teacher scripture and the church is teaching them no well the bad news is this doesn't work they will give you the fact so that they will get an a in their exam but after they graduate they'll stop believing it so maybe we should not teach our faith and values as fact the other way which is the opposite extreme is to say is to teach the faith and values as opinion no this is my opinion that christ is the savior this is my opinion that we should all be honest now what's wrong with teaching people fact and or as opinion you know whether you're teaching faith or values you're telling them it's up to you you can choose whatever you no know? you can choose to believe whatever you want you can choose to embrace any value you want it's your opinion i will respect we are both equally correct now maybe we're being invited to teach our faith and values not as fact not as opinion but as judgment we want to tell them as far as scripture is concerned as far as the church is concerned as far as our faith community is concerned these are the correct judgments christ is the savior honesty is good does it make sense or not because a judgment you have to evaluate and you're telling them this has been evaluated for centuries your job now is to think critically look at your life and look at the world and evaluate these judgments that we are offering to you so we are now empowering our students no to make their own judgment but we are also challenging them that they cannot make their judgment only as an opinion they have to be able to defend their judgment they have to use reason to be able to make their judgment okay so again a different shift no in trying to teach values and trying to teach faith this time we don't want them to just shut up and listen to their authority when we teach something as fact 
We don't want them to just rebel against authority and just accept what they want to do, which is opinion. We want a balance between the two. No? We want them to say, these are judgments and you must use reason to evaluate them and make your own judgment. Okay? Fine. Uh, and of course, in online, in online learning information, there's a lot of opportunities for sharing. No? And when we're trying to form their values, this is a very powerful piece. No? How can we design their experience so that our students can share deeply with one another? No? Now, many people say, oh, face-to-face -face is better. It's more personal. But I'd like to tell you, in my experience, no, when I teach a class, the sharing is done only by the most extroverted people in class, only those who are the least shy. But when I do an online sharing, everyone shares because they are not pressured. They can think about what they want to say and then they type it in the discussion board. And the other surprising thing I encountered, when you have an online discussion board, the sharing there is more personal and deeper compared to the classroom. Why? Very understandable. Because in the classroom, you get embarrassed. But in the discussion board, you have more time to think about what to share. So my dear educators, as far as formation is concerned, as far as sharing deeply and personal, personally are concerned, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of opportunities. So I'd like to encourage you to think about opportunities you can create for your students, for them to share. Finally, the third part of formation, we already have faith, we have values. The final part is service. No? How do we form them in terms of service? The key word is empathy. For them to feel for their neighbor. No? And there are many ways of doing this online. No? There are many stories online, many videos online that are very moving. You know? For example, the stories of refugees. Instead of just giving them numbers and statistics, you can you know, look for clips on YouTube and share stories, short stories, very moving stories of experiences of refugees. What refugees went through, what people their age, you know, who do not have the same thing they have, who are thrown out of their countries, who cross oceans no? in great danger, losing family, losing possessions. No? This way we can build empathy. No? And at the same time, no? we build empathy not only for people who are like them, but also and especially for strangers. No? Because that's what service is. Service is not helping people who are like us. Service is having empathy for people who are different from us, who are strangers, but we want to serve them because it is what we should do as human beings. And again, going online will allow you to be more vast, no? to be able to connect more with strangers. Maybe before you would send them to a community in your town or city for them to get to know the poor. But now they can't do that. But they can get to know more people, more strangers across the world. There are many opportunities that you can create for your students. No? Okay? So I'd like to end by just saying that there used to be a saying that we are familiar with in English, which says, let's cross the bridge when we get there. No? Let's worry about that problem when we get there. Well, I'm sorry, that's no longer a saying that's applicable to us educators today. This saying is already outdated. There's now a new version of this saying. We don't say anymore, let's cross the bridge when we get there. Now we say, let's build the bridge as we are crossing it. Because there is no bridge, my dear educators. If you're asking yourself, how am I going to do online formation? We don't know. The only way to do it is to try it. There is no bridge. No? Do not look for a bridge. You have to build the bridge. No? As we are crossing it, we have to build the bridge. But the good news is we are building the bridge together. And we can learn from one another. And so my final message to you is 
there is a crisis there are a lot of but there are a lot of opportunities no? do not look for formulas do not look for templates no? there is no template yet there is no bridge yet we are building the bridge together we will figure things out together we will learn together how to do online formation so if you are anxious that's normal if you don't know what to do that's also normal so my dear educators i'd like to just encourage you to give it your best shot. All of us are trying our best to do our mission. Thank you very much. Fumeka, could you unmute your microphone? Okay, I will repeat. Thank you, Dr. Go, for your inspiration and especially your encouragement to build the bridge together as we cross it. Thank you very much. And uh, to your participants, you can ask your questions according to the format that we have already uh, shared to you. Now we are going to continue, ladies and gentlemen, with our second uh, speaker today, Dr. Johannes Eko Piano. That's how we pronounce uh, his name. Um, he got his uh, undergraduate degree in mathematics from Gajah Mada University and his master degree on computer science from Ateneo de Manila uh, Graduate School of Business and from University Putra, Malaysia, his PhD in Graduate School of Management on management information systems and Dr. Eko is now the rector of Sanata Dharma University and chairman of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities in Asia Pacific. His expertise among others uh, on relational database design analysis and design of information systems and analysis of e-government using actor network theory dr echo will deliver uh, the topic Continuing what Dr. Go has started now on the Indonesian context. So the topic that Dr. Eka, Eko, sorry, Dr. Eko would like to deliver is on student formation through online environment in Indonesian context. So Dr. Eko, the time is yours. Let's give our applause, virtual applause to Dr. Eko to welcome him. Oh, Dr. Eko, excuse me, could you unmute your... Sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot to use my microphone. Once again, I thank you very much for Ibu Mika who has uh, introduced me to all participants. Uh, good morning, everyone who are joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I am very happy uh, to have this kind of uh, opportunity. And first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Hope and United Board for inviting me as one of the speakers in this very interesting and contextual webinar. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, allow me to uh, share my screen.
I hope you have already uh, my screen. And as you can see on your screen, the topic that was asked to me is about student formation through online environment in Indonesian context. Uh, because uh, I'm the second presenter and Dr. Johnny Go has presented some basic uh, element of formation in online environment, then my, my job is much easier. And even I finally realized that some of his notion, some of his idea is always the same with the one that I will share to all of you. When we look at to this uh, theme or topic, for me, who has a background in science and mathematics, this topic is, is, is big. I mean, uh, it has many issues related to student formation in the online environment, especially when we also include the Indonesian context. Therefore, to simplify the topics and to help you all participants uh, following my presentation easier, I broke up this big team into several question as listed here. And basically my presentation will be just set of answers to all these questions, though uh, I didn't make uh, my answer uh, following this question because all this uh, question is uh, interrelated to each other. Let me start with uh, what is there is there any problem did uh, ibu meka could you could you see my presentation because i just got information from prauda um we cannot see the second screen yet your questions dr echo so yes now okay, now, now can you see slide for the questions yeah. yes sorry sorry for uh, some uh, technical problem yes uh, i broke up that uh, team because for me that team the topic is uh, uh, complex and big into several question and then basically my my presentation will be an answers will be answers to all these uh, question so let me start with uh, the first uh, reflection the first uh, understanding to what we are having right now what really has changed us during this pandemic technically speaking many of our daily life and campus life has changed a lot we have to wash our hands regularly we have to wear masks we have to avoid gathering and stop visiting others. And the most difficult part for me is to stop visiting some interesting places. However, if we think deeply, that kind of new attitude of new daily life actually is no problem at all because the cause of this new habit is that we are now prohibited to interact or communicate physically, intensively. And now ICT takes place, play its role to mediate us for our interaction and for our communications. But when we are trying to use this ICT as a new medium for our communication and interaction, finally, we realize that our physical interaction is so meaningful. It's richness, 
cannot be easily replaced by ICT mediated interaction. And as a result, and as a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there is a feedback. And as a result, we cannot enjoy our online learning. What, what I mean by we, it does not mean that it is for our student only, but also include our lectures, our professor, especially those who have been senior in our campus. It is not only our student, but both of our student and lectures cannot easily enjoy our online learning. Why? Because the online learning or ICT mediated interaction has removed some important and meaningful values of our life. Though I also believe that ICT, as has been mentioned by Father Jonico, provide multi-sensory and also multi-platform for communication. And even it also facilitate a more efficient and but remove physical and, and even remove physical and time boundary. However, as I mentioned before, it cannot fully replace some essential values of direct or non-mediated interactions. When we look at this uh, given table, you, all of you can see that some very essential values like authenticity, permanence, stability, formality, and physical health is very important and very essential, but it could be a threat if we are entering or we are using online environment. The main question we have, if those uh, important values such as authenticity, permanency, and physical health is essential in our whole person education, then how we should understand this kind of reality? How to negotiate our action and how to reconstruct our learning so that those opportunities offered by ICT or online environment could be optimally used and at the same time, how to minimize how to control all possible threats produced by online environment. But before doing that, we should understand why this ICT or online environment produce equally both to opportunities and also threats. Uh, <laughs> For me, there are at least three phenomena that characterize the trend of ICT development, namely convergence, intelligence, and disintermediation. Among these three phenomenon, phenomena, I'm sorry, disintermediation is the most influential one to our whole person education concern. And this intermediation means decreasing 
role or function of those who play as mediator or agent or bridge or link to connect or facilitate interaction or transaction between two parties. When I mention bridge in this uh, context, uh, it should not be uh, considered as the same bridge that Father Jonico uh, just mentioned in his uh, uh, presentation. Because of this disintermediation, nowadays we do not need postman anymore. We do not need bank teller. We do not need tourists and hotel agency. But when we continue or we imagine the next development of ICT and we reflect our own position as a lecturer or as an educator, then we will uh, finally uh, come up with the new awareness that basically lectures and educators play also its role as a mediator. And therefore, all of us as an educator might be irrelevant, irrelevant in the near future. So it is not only about pandemic, a global pandemic, who will, uh, who, uh, that has put ourselves in a very difficult situation. The development ICT itself, whether it is in the pandemic or it is not in the pandemic, we are in the position to be replaced if we could not find a new role in this uh, ICT environment. And this intermediation phenomenon, it then will intensify and cover more and more sectors as ICT become smarter due to the advanced development of artificial intelligence. So the gadget we have, the smartphone we have from day to day become smarter and clever, even maybe someday will be smarter than us. And other related phenomenon to contribute to the intense disintermediation is the convergent, where many function could be done using single technology product such as smartphone. That is why the main usage of smartphone now is no longer to function as a phone, but instead for taking photos, playing videos, and making many kinds of transactions. Because many functions, many uh, tasks could be done using just single gadget. That's the uh, phenomena of conversion. Now, the next question to answer is, uh, are those uh, changes in our context, whether in the pandemic context and ICT context, essential to our concern on whole person education and why? Uh, luckily, Father Johnny has mentioned it is not about the digital environment or online environment. It is about how to design so that our design for the whole person education maximize the potential of ICT and how to minimize its threat in implementing whole person education. The problem we have when we uh, look at our online environment to implement our concern on whole person education is that this environment is relatively new to most of 
all of us. But what I mean new is not the online environment in reality new. This online environment has been with us for the last 20 years. The problem, while we are having pandemic, we are forced to live this new ecosystem, this new environment. And suddenly we feel that we are not ready, we have problem, we are not familiar, but we have no choice. We have to use this new environment as the only platform, as the only system that we should use to continue our service, to educate and to prepare our student. Therefore, Sorry. Therefore, the most important thing when we are talking, when we are discussing the whole person education in this online environment should be start from the strong framework to implement whole person education. Fortunately, what I mentioned here has been also mentioned by Father Jonico. I propose this framework. First, I, uh, I uh, formulated like this. The more indirect is the better. Why? Because uh, some of us may believe that implementing whole person, e whole person education is a matter of direct nurturing in physical ecosystem. While we believe that whole person education will be more effective if it is indirect through some interesting and meaningful learning activities. If we use this kind, of frame, this kind of framework, then it is not appropriate to expect that our concern on whole person education can only be done after pandemic finish. And we start doing the same thing by nurturing or telling our student to do this, to do that. And by using this uh, framework, as uh, Father Jonico mentioned, it is no problem at all actually to have, to only have online environment because the principle is very clear. If it is more indirect, then it is better for our student formation. That's why, uh, Since five years ago, we in Sanata Dharma also promoted the notion of cybernetic space as the most appropriate space for full person education because we are fully aware that we cannot stop the growth and the uh, strong uh, contribution, the strong features, the relevant features of ICT, and we have to maximize its role in educating our students. But as a Jesuit university, we have been developing our campus in such a way, campus is a new, it's a good place for our students to have physical interaction through any many kind of activities like sport, 
art performance, music performance, and so on. And therefore, we in Sanata Dharma propose or start doing to improve our capacity in developing the so-called cybernetic space. What we mean by cybernetics, cybernetic space, it is an integrative view of our reality as a combination of physical and virtual space. By using this kind of uh, perspective, then we will maximize both our physical reality and at the same time, our virtual uh, reality. However, due to pandemic of COVID-19, starting last semester, we have to pause our commitment to develop our cybernetic space. So the new football field, the new auditorium, the new facilities we develop in our physical space right now cannot be used for, for a while. And, but we hope later on, when we can finish our pandemic, we will uh, try to use it again as part of cybernetic space to maximize our student formation. Now, the last, uh, the third point in my proposed framework is that the whole person education or student formation should be integrated with daily learning. It, it is not enough if the way we understand student formation is totally separate from their daily activities in class. And therefore, later on, I, mention, I will mention that in Sanata Therma, as part of Jesuit University, we will uh, implement the so-called Ignatian pedagogy. Now, next, based on this uh, three point in my proposed framework, the next question to answer is, how do we reconstruct our learning from our online learning from the perspective of whole person education? As Father Janiko mentioned, the most important thing is design. No problem, the, uh, the system we use, either physical or virtual, but the most important thing is how to design it. First of all, when we are using online environment to design our class so that it has enough concern on whole person education, we should start first change our orientation. And many times, I always say this in Sanata Dharma to all my colleagues in Sanata Dharma, that the most important thing is not on how to teach, but on how to facilitate students to learn well. So the focus should be to our students. Therefore, our online learning should be developed to support independent learning. And, but we also realize that the independent learning will be effective if we employ group project-based learning or case-based learning. Why is like that? Because the way I understand the uh, problem in improving our student formation is that they depend a lot their, to their peers. As mentioned by Father Johnny Go, learning is never an individual in India for. It is always social in India for. So the way we design uh, our online learning should be based on an activity that will invite our students 
to collaborate, to uh, have a collaboration activity with their classmate or with their peer. So the setting we are developing in, uh, in uh, implementing online learning should be uh, a collaborative learning. Uh, by using this uh, collaborative approach, uh, we, we are hoping that our students will have enough opportunity to understand themselves better, to have opportunity to work together, to respect others, and there are many values, good values, to prepare themselves to enter a job market. Now, it is time to reflect the problem, the realities we have in implementing our online learning environment. First, for me, pandemic of COVID-19 could be positioned as a trigger and also a speed up to implement cybernetic space. Though for a while, we cannot fully use our physical space, but it is good time. It is a uh, right time to enter the new kind of learning, though this kind of learning has been there for a long time. But this is a very good time because we have to use that kind of learning environment. However, we have to realize that most of our students, especially in Indonesian context, are not ready to embrace this learning because most of them, they are, re they are not ready to have independent learning. Why? The way I understand it like this, because especially in Indonesian context, most of our students are rooted from agricultural society and therefore learning in general is a social India for. This realities bring consequence that togetherness and real social bounding are very essential to the learning, to the learning performance. So uh, I feel when our students joining online class, they feel alone and, and the way uh, they enjoy uh, the learning process is very difficult because they are learning uh, activity, I think they feel like it's very dry and very lonely. And, and lastly, for me, character building especially happen in social setting and therefore learning dynamic and online learning should be designed to facilitate intimate and meaningful interaction among students. Finally, uh, my last presentation is about a reflection to what we have done in Sanata Dharma. Maybe uh, this uh, point uh, will be uh, meaningful and can be said to all of uh, to all uh, participant. But uh, actually, I cannot stop reflecting what uh, we are doing in Sanata Dharma because actually uh, we are struggling. We are struggling uh, not only to deliver our class uh, optimally, but we are struggling how to have uh, suit information in this uh, pandemic situation. First, uh, we have to your, be... Uh, your screen, Michael, the next screen. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we have a pandemic situation and we have to adopt online learning. Uh, our commitment to implement uh, Ignatian pedagogy because uh, as uh, Jesuit University, we inherit uh, Ignatian pedagogy that has uh, orientation to prepare our students to have three uh, competence, uh, three uh, attitude, that is uh, competence, conscience, and compassion. And therefore we have uh, been doing some activities. First, we promote, uh, I, I call it an online learning, online learning spirituality. So we have a conference, we have a seminar to uh, reflect 
what kind of uh, attitude, uh, understanding, awareness to embrace this online uh, situation. And therefore, we have to uh, maintain our intimate engagement and we have to develop awareness that is uh, new awareness to consider that it is not campus anymore, but house is our new avenue for education and growth. This kind of awareness is very important because sometimes we forget that our student is now at their house, no longer they are in campus and house so far never been conceptualized as a place for learning. And therefore, we should uh, develop the so-called uh, pandemic sensitive learning. And therefore, it should not only be developed based on online learning characteristic, but should also be uh, based on new understanding that house is new, house and its environment is new learning uh, situation or condition. Of course, we, we did also some technical improvement like improve our existing learning management system. And therefore, we have several activities to train our staff, to train our educators and lectures. But all this thing has, uh, has been done. But before doing these activities, we started with, uh, by talking with our students. So we initiated all this improvement by first listening to our student and our preparation to fully develop online learning uh, will be based on our understanding to our student problem and situation. Of course, we also improve our ICT infrastructure and we keep uh, improving our communication channel and the new thing we are doing right now is developing digital television because my struggle as the leader of this university is how to communicate better with our new student, with new situation. And therefore, digital television might be a good uh, tool, a good uh, facility that can improve our engagement to our student. That's all I can say this morning. I'm sorry if some of my presentation cannot easily uh, and be understood. And therefore, thank you for your attention. And I will be happy if you have questions or uh, comment to my presentation and ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eka. We can give a round virtual applause one more time to thank him, especially because uh, Dr. Eka has given us some specific context to sample or to uh, clarify what uh, Dr. Go has initiated with the concept of formation program. We could see that when Dr. Go said about how the design of the formation program matters, Dr. Eko suggested some reconstructuring online learning from the whole person education perspectives. And some questions I saw in the chat room was, uh, were also already answered as pa Eko, Dr. Eko also gave an example of how uh, Sanata Dharma has helped the students in need and also started to listen to them. Now we are going to continue with the third keynote speaker of today who will interestingly talk about the students' perspectives. So it seems like the three keynote speakers uh, having the topics in relation to one another. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, let me also introduce you now to uh, Dr. Liao Tongjie or uh, Dr. Aditya Nugraha from Petra Christian University. 
Yes, okay. He has uh, his undergraduate degree from Petra Christian University in electrical engineering and his master degree in library and information science with Fulbright scholarship from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And his PhD degree is on information studies from Curtin University, Western Australia, the Endeavour Postgraduate Scholar from the Australian Department of Education. And his position now is as Director of the Excellence in Learning and Teaching Center, or ELTC, the next screen, please, Budebi. That's it. Thank you. Before, uh, after uh, he finished his office as director of the library, Petra Christian University. His interests, among others, are in digital repositories, open access, and educational technology. Dr. Aditya Nugraha is one of the whole person education ambassadors after he finished his whole person education academy in 2018 whole person education echo training the next year and whole person harvest seminar in the same year in 2019 so ladies and gentlemen let us give our warm applause to Dr. Aditya Nugraha with his topic on student voices on online learning. Dr. Aditya, the time is yours. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you, Bumeka. Uh, can you all see my PowerPoint and yes. my voice? Okay, my voice is okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, today I will be uh, delivering uh, the results of the survey that we have conducted at Petra Christian University uh, to students on their uh, perspective on the online learning. So, uh, but before we go there, I would like uh, to have a, for us to have a little refresh, refreshing activity. Uh, I will use Mentimeter, which I have uh, learned also as well from the Whole Person Education Academy in, in Ateneo. So if you would like to join me, uh, could you please uh, take your smartphone or you can open a new window in your laptop and then open an internet browser, uh, go to menti.com and then enter the six digit code uh, on the top of the slide and then uh, click submit and then we will I, I only have three short questions so just to refresh us and then yeah and then uh, I, I see some of you have already interacted uh, so if you have uh, entered the code you can see the 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 heart symbol uh, you can click on the heart symbol if you like uh, and then uh, and it will be reflected on on my page okay uh, I, I will just wait like a few more seconds for people to get into menti before i display my first question today so yeah uh, 13 14 people already i, I will i won't be waiting for the whole participants to uh, to participate because it will take too much time so i will just maybe wait until maybe 50 50 people okay. and then i will start my presentation about the the result of the survey so basically i just uh, i'm just sharing the result of the survey which of course there are some limitations because the survey is conducted in at Petra Christian University, so some aspect might be applicable to other universities, some aspect might not be applicable to other universities. So that's that's the, the context of my uh, presentation today. Uh, there are a number of uh, things uh, that I will not be presenting because there are too, too much to share, so I will just focus on the, the most important thing in the 
uh, in the uh, in the survey, especially what are the students' perception on the uh, online learning, which we have to say it's forced upon uh, all of us, either the lecturers or the students. So it's kind of a, like a sudden something uh, very uh, influential or fundamental change because of the COVID, because of the virus, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we have to uh, do everything online. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, 40 people already, so maybe, yeah, a few more seconds and then I will just uh, start the, my first question. Okay. Okay, maybe uh, I don't have to wait until 50. I'll just uh, start with the, with the first question now. Okay, so I would like to see where you are uh, connecting or joining this webinar from. Uh, only from region because I cannot uh, put individual countries because there will be too many choices. So I have to uh, group uh, some countries together like Indonesia and Timor Leste, Singapore and Malaysia, the Philippines, and oh, there are others as well. Okay. Yeah, mostly from Indonesia. Yeah, that's normal to be expected. The Philippines, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, second question uh, will be yeah. Just a few more seconds to give the opportunity to the others. Yes, mostly from Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll move to the second question. Uh, which is during this COVID-19, if you have to choose only one option, which one will you choose? Fully online instruction or blended? 50-50 uh, still. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. More people selected uh, blended instruction. Okay. Yeah, about, about uh, two to one, uh, but, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now the last question. Uh, you have to type for this one, so you you don't you don't select, but you have to type just just short short uh, statement. What's the number one difficulty according to you that your students are facing in online instructions? If you have typed it and then yeah, okay. Ah, internet connection, okay. Uh, two out of three already said internet connection. Four, five, six. Okay, internet action, internet connection, internet access. Yeah, seems like many of us agree that internet connection is the, the number one problem for our students to participate in our online instructions. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. All, all said something about connection or in uh, internet connection or yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I think I got the uh, approximately the the general perception of the lecturers of what is the number one difficulty for students. Okay. Okay. I'll just uh, proceed to my presentation uh, about the survey. Okay. So I would like to introduce first about our university. So we, I'm from Petra Christian University. It's a medium-sized private university located in Surabaya, and Surabaya is the second largest city in Indonesia after Jakarta. Okay. And we have approximately eight thousand eight eight. 8,500 uh, students, mostly undergraduate. We have seven faculties, including four international programs, and then six postgraduate departments. Uh, our university is part of the Petra Christian Schools Network, which comprises of uh, 28 schools from uh, uh, playgroup, kindergarten, and uh, primary up to uh, high school. But our university is independently uh, and separately managed from the uh, rest of the school network. So even though we are still have a very good connection. 
and the majority of our students are of Chinese Indonesian descent and coming from middle to upper socioeconomic status. So that's, that's the background of our uh, university. And then the timeline of events uh, regarding uh, the COVID-19. So from the left, in 19th of March, we started the online learning. We call it in Indonesia, it's uh, PJJ, Pembelajaran Jarak Jauh, or uh, Long Distance Education. This is uh, enacted because of uh, we want to anticipate the worsening situation in, in our hometown, especially relating to COVID-19. So beginning 16 March, uh, all students uh, started to learn from home. But the, the lecturers, the staff, they are still coming to campus. So during the 16th, 17th to 19th of March, we conducted the emergency workshops for lecturers. Uh, we provide them trainings on how to use the learning management systems that we have, the video conferencing software, the how to record lectures, uh, and then uh, uh, using your PowerPoint to record your own voice over your slides and then uh, use it for the LMS. And then on the 20th of March, because of the worsening situation, the university decided that all lecturers and general staff should start working from home. So basically, uh, it's a campus lockdown. And then on the 28th of April, there is the, the citywide lockdown, or we call it uh, large-scale social restrictions imposed in our Surabaya city, beginning with 28th of April up to 11th of May. And then this uh, lockdown is, uh, well, it's not really lockdown. It's like just uh, social restrictions because people can still go out, but uh, very limited. Uh, this social restriction has been uh, extended twice until 8th of June and then uh, it's a new normal basically. But people are still encouraged to wear masks, social physical distancing and then hand washing etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, starting on 19th of March, uh, we conducted a, a excellence in learning and teaching center. We conducted an online survey for students and the survey uh, lasted slightly until May, but we uh, we took the data until 24th of April, and then uh, it, it becomes a, a project for students to uh, to process that data statistically, and then uh, present the results to us. And then we use the online survey method using Google Form. It's uh, very simple, and then we have a voluntary responses from students. The limitation is that the survey is just like our moving to online learning is emergency, meaning it's not designed with proper training planning. So it's just basically, okay, we now have to go to online uh, learning and then we just conducted the survey. So it's very simple survey. And then the data collection is, uh, <clears throat> we distributed the link of the Google form to lecturers and then uh, ask them to ask the lecturers to uh, show the students the link so that the students can submit their responses after online sessions. And so far uh, during that time period from 19th of March to 24th of April, we have uh, accumulated uh, approximately one, almost, almost 2,000 responses from students. But the responses can, each student could, could submit more than one responses. So it's not, it doesn't mean uh, nine, uh, 1,958 students responded. It's just that we collected that many responses from we don't know how many students, uh, maybe approximately more than 1,000. Okay, and this is one the first uh, data that I could show you the, the distribution of our respondents across faculties. Uh, basically, the Distribution uh, is reflective of our uh, the, the student body in each faculty at Petra Christian University. It's just that there is one exception. The FPE means the Faculty of Business and Economic. It it has more students, but in this case, uh, it has less uh, responses compared to the FTI. This is Faculty of Technological Engineering. So, but the, all the rest of the faculty are reflective. Uh, based on their uh, number of students. 
And I have to mention the credit for the graphics and the data processing to three of our students, Erika Giovanni Sugianto, Rudy Darmawan, and Sharon Natasha Sutanto. 96.8% of the responses uh, we got from undergraduate students because as I mentioned, our student body consisted of mainly uh, undergraduate students. Okay. Now the, the student perception on the online learning. We asked the students to rate about their experience their, of their online learning or PJJ in, in Indonesia, Indonesian. And then uh, this is the basically the general overview that we have. So very negative uh, perception is only 2% negative perception about 10%. Neutral, meaning they say, okay, nah, that's okay. 36% uh, positive, 38, and then very positive 14%. So basically uh, there were only 12% of students uh, who viewed the, their experience of the online learning as negative or very negative. And we want also to see, this is the, the general uh, overview for the whole period of the survey. But now we want to, I, I would like to show you the change in the student perception based on the, uh, on the weekly basis. So basically the period of the survey, it was five weeks. So that's how the perception of the students uh, evolved uh, from week one, two, three, four, and five. So as you can see here, uh, there is a, like a decline in the perception up to the third week, and then it's basically going up again to its uh, its uh, starting point. Uh, we could only I could only uh, speculate that the decrease was due to the uh, what you call it, the midterm exam uh, because we had uh, we had received uh, various complaints of the, their experience in the midterm exam. But after the midterm exam, the perception uh, rose up again the uh, percentage is on the left okay and then now uh, besides the quantitative information that i give you we also in the survey we ask two simple questions to the students uh, do you have any uh, input uh, critics uh, maybe or suggestions and then, then question number two is do you have any unique experience during your online learning sessions? So based on that, on, on those two questions, uh, we could categorize all the responses into five different things, which is uh, we call the 5M method, which consists of from, from uh, upper right and counterclock, uh, sorry, clockwise is a man, machine, method, material, and money. And then uh, from man, it's uh, 19%, 19, uh, almost 20% uh, contributed to the problems. So it, it means that 20% of the problems relating to the man factor. What, what are those? Uh, about lecturers, about their teaching techniques, about the students themselves because of uh, the lack of self-discipline or boredom or distractions that they experience during the online learning, which might not be happening during the physical classes. But these things came up during the online learning or online uh, classes. And then the second thing is about machine. A machine uh, contributes 25% from of the overall problem, consists of the learning management software, video conferencing software, uh, internet connection, uh, general hardware or software issues or problems, uh, those are 25% uh, of the whole problem. But the biggest problem is the method, which contribute more than half, 50.4% of the whole problem. This includes uh, too many assignments, they complain, and then the, the students complain too many assignments, conflict of schedule, communication, the lack of structure in the in the whole learning, uh, online learning experience, and then the, about the synchronous versus asynchronous sessions of the online learning. I will talk more about uh, this later. And then 
smaller, much smaller number is about material, uh, only 1.2%. It's about the technical subject that involves maths. I think I saw one of the questions in the chat Zoom, in the uh, chat section of the Zoom about this question as well. That in, in certain uh, subjects, uh, lecturers found it difficult to explain if it's too uh, too technical or uh, needs to uh, a lot of mathematical equations. It's difficult for them to explain that to the students. And then the the last aspect is about money, uh, three point five percent. It's about internet or data quota. Basically, uh, that this uh, online learning requires students to buy. Uh, what we call in Indonesia is an internet quota or data quota. Okay, so basically that's it. So uh, uh, out of these five uh, categories, I would focus on the two uh, most, uh, the two biggest uh, percentage, which is the method and the machine. And then my uh, next slides will focus on these two. Okay. Now about the method that contributes 50, 54% of the problems for the students. Number one is about assignment. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's the students said that it's just too much. Okay. Uh, I, I will just try to uh, read some of the, so lecturers tend to add more assignments than previously agreed upon at the beginning of the semester because the semester started when it was still uh, physical classes, offline classes, but then after maybe four weeks or five weeks, we had to switch wholly to uh, online classes. So some lecturers with this switch, they add more assignments than previously agreed upon at the beginning of the semester. This tendency can either be on top of the online synchronous session or video conference, or the assignments were given to compensate for the lack of or absence of the online synchronous session by lec the lecturers. Okay, so basically some, some lecturers, they switch to uh, online sessions, they give uh, video conferencing sessions, but they add the assignments. Or some, uh, uh, some lecturers, they had difficulty in uh, utilizing the new software, the new technology. So basically they, in the first few weeks of the online learning, uh, period, they just stop giving uh, synchronous session. So meaning no video video conference session. So they instead, they just add more assignments to compensate for the lack of or the absence of the uh, video conferencing sessions. Some, uh, mostly older lecturers, have some difficulties in adapting these new tools or technologies to, uh, uh, to conduct online learning, either the LMS or the video conferencing software. Uh, even though we have introduced the software uh, during the emergency workshop sessions, but maybe it's it's just too fast. Uh, it's just too quickly moving and then it's uh, too short. So they still need time to process everything. So they have some difficulties. Okay. Uh, this complaint is by far the, the most dominant one from the students. So many students are complaining about this aspect. Too many assignments. Okay, and then number two is about uh, scheduling conflict. I don't know, maybe because lecturers think that, oh, synchronous online learning, meaning that uh, it can be conducted at any time, right? So some lecturers just hold the online uh, video conferencing. The session was held outside of the regular class schedule. And this has caused some conflicts of schedule with other classes. So students are, are I mean, uh, in, a, in a dilemma because this a, a particular lecturer has changed the schedule that will uh, also taken the time of other schedule. And then uh, this has created a lot of headache for the, for the students. Number three is about the online test. This is why uh, I speculated that the decrease in the student perception on the third week was, I think, one of the contributing factor is this online test. I think it's mostly about the mindset. Many lecturers still think that like, students will cheat. Okay, so uh, some lecturers, because of this mindset, 
some lecturers tend to be too rigid with online tests. For example, uh, because they have the mindset that students will cheat if they are not monitored closely as in the physical classes. So these lecturers, they look for ways to make it hard for students to cheat in online tests. It can be done in the form of grouping some questions and assigning a certain amount of time, maybe uh, usually very tightly timed, before the students can move on to the next group of questions and so on and so on. So a very tightly timed uh, uh, group of questions before they could move to the another group of question. This has created an unnecessary stressful situation for students since they need more time to work on the online environment, especially in doing tests online. This is due to the newness of the environment as well as the internet connection aspect. So some students do not have reliable or fast enough internet connection. Many students said that they have experienced panic due to the continuing counting down of the time on, in the online text. So it, it, I mean, it, it gives them a, a sense of urgency, but at the, at the end, it creates a panic. Things will get even worse when the students get a connection problem or laptop problem or computer problem. They went into panic mode, of course. So instead of preventing students from cheating, the measures that have taken by the lecturers have caused other students to do worse in online tests due to the stress. So uh, we can talk more about that in, in the question and answer if you, if you are interested. But number four, it's about environment. Online learning means new environment for most of the students. Uh, this relates also to the third uh, aspect from the students, which is the new environment and technical problem. So with this new uh, adjustment, not only the lecturers, but also the students, even though they are millennial generation, they adapt more quickly than their lecturers, but still, this is a new uh, learning and teaching environment. Lecturers and students need time to adjust. So uh, in, in, in the perspective of the lecturers, they still need to adapt that your teaching met method on the physical classes may not be able to be, uh, uh, what you call that, uh, exported directly as they are into the online environment. You might want to make some changes. So the mindset has to be changed as well. Okay. And then for the, for the students, it, it's relating to this whole new environment, the stress, additional stress that they have uh, while they are doing their tests, while doing their learning, the distractions, and then the, even the, the physical space that they have, not many students, I mean, not all students have a quiet uh, space or not, many, not all students have their own private room where they can uh, do the online learning in, in, a, in a, a conducive uh, environment. Some might have too many distractions around them while they are learning. Okay, so the number one, but again, it's about the assignment. The assignment is the number one uh, complaint from the students. And then uh, about now we cut to the, the second aspect, which is a machine, which contributed 25% of the whole problems. So basically uh, we have our own LMS that we call Lentera or Moodle. Uh, uh, it's based on Moodle, but we name it Lentera. It's, uh, the second, but we also uh, give the freedom to the lecturers because it's, it's a sudden uh, move to online learning. Our LMS was not ready at that time to handle all the online learning activities from all the classes. So at that time, we had a policy that all lecturers, you are free to use all the LMS that you deem uh, suitable for your classes. So. Basically, uh, more lecturers at our university uh, selected to use Google Classroom, 80, 82% something, and then the Lantera, 60, about 60%. Why is not 100%? Because one lecturer can, can uh, select it more than one option. And then there are other options as well, the other option here. And then about the video conference software, 
during our emergency workshop sessions, we 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 talk uh, several different uh, kind of uh, software for video conferencing, and it ended up that Google Meet or Hangout uh, is in the first position, and then Zoom, and then Cisco WebEx, and then others uh, other softwares. But these two are the two uh, players, Google Meet and Zoom. We have a Google Suite subscription, so most of our lecturers use uh, Google Meet or Google, yeah. And then uh, some lecturers use Zoom. Okay, and then to the next slide. This is the, break, the breaking down of the use of video conferencing software based on uh, faculty. So as you can see here, most of the faculties use Meet uh, more than Zoom with the exception of two faculties, which is the FSD means a faculty of uh, art and design and then FTSP that include uh, the department of architecture. So these two faculties, because their nature of their, their subject, uh, the field of study, they need Zoom, particularly because of the annotation uh, function of Zoom, because they have to it's something that is visual to their students. They, uh, most of the lecturers in uh, these two faculties elected to use a Zoom more than Google Meet. But in other faculties, uh, Google Meet is uh, the number one. Yeah, uh, just have one or two more slides. Now, the second aspect in the machine aspect is the internet hardware software some of the technical or machine aspect involved in the conducting online instruction experienced by students using uh, during COVID-19. The major problem is the data connection as uh, uh, the previous two keynote speakers have uh, alluded to that data connection is a big problem even though no big problem in the big cities like in Surabaya okay but even though in Surabaya some of our students have complained that they have financial issues uh, to buy the internet quota because with all the accessing of uh, the digital resources and then the video conferencing they need a lot of uh, uh, internet quota and then some of our students went back to their home localities and this can mean uh, very far away in the in the East Nusa Tenggara or in the Molukan Island uh, where they have experiencing uh, have been experiencing problems with data connection in terms of the signal coverage, in terms of the internet re connection reliability or the speed. So this has become uh, uh, a big problem for our students. And then the, the second uh, uh, with the less intensity is the hardware and software. Because we are uh, giving the freedom to the faculties to use whatever learning management software that they, they want, uh, video, whatever video conferencing software that they uh, find it useful. So different lecturers will use different kind of software and these are kind of a, like uh, confusing for, for some students. So they said that uh, need, we need to have some more, uh, some standardization for the use of uh, software for LMS and for video conferencing. And then about computer laptop, smartphone are now the main tools for learning. It used to be uh, additional tools. Now it's the main tools headphone, headset, earphone, now essentials. It used to be just for entertainment in the past, but now it's so essential, as well as with any other uh, uh, additional hardware and software that lecturers or students need to uh, purchase because they could no longer, uh, or they had some problem, problem accessing certain software from the, from the lab at, on campus. Now, some of them have to install their own software in their, in their home. Okay, so those are basically ju just the uh, overview of the survey results. Uh, I'm just focusing on the, on the main uh, problem of the two aspects of the man and machine. And uh, just uh, to close my presentation, I just to show you that we just published a, a book. Uh, we call it Mendadak Daring, uh, which in English uh, literally translated into suddenly online because we, we are forced to be online suddenly. We have released these uh, e-books uh, to the public on the 29th of June, but unfortunately, it's only available in Bahasa Indonesia. 
we are we still don't know whether we will be translating this to English, but uh, we'll let you know if we do decide on that. So yeah, basically that's the uh, the whole of my presentations, and I uh, would like to give the time back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aditya, for a very stunning uh, survey result from the students' perspectives, from the students' voices. And uh, we would also proceed now, as time really is tight, um, we are going to proceed with question and answer uh, session which was supposed to be 20 minutes actually, but uh, the committee has just contacted me that we only have 15 minutes for the questions. So um, could you please um, give me a permission to not um, reading or not mentioning the name of the person who asked the questions and give me permission on combining the questions into one, for example, when you have uh, several related questions. And I will also um, ask every speaker to respond to the questions in maximum five minutes. So I hope you give me uh, your permission to do that just for uh, the time efficiency. Um, the first question now will be for uh, Dr. Go. Um, Dr. Go, there is a question about what if you have um, students from different uh, faiths and actually the institution doesn't um, ask you to share the gospel, but you know you have to share the gospel. And another thing is what if uh, the parents at home have different perspectives in the formation uh, program, especially according to this questioner, uh, in values. Okay. Um, another thing, I, th I think you already answered, Dr. Go, one question with, uh, one long question with one short answer about the balance of synchronous and asynchronous, just to uh, make sure there is the personal interaction between the teacher and the students. So if you want to also um, clarify what you mean with the balance between synchronous and asynchronous, you are welcome. So there are three things that I think I uh, have selected together with two attendants uh, in YouTube and uh, Zoom platforms for you to have to go to uh, respond. Okay, Thank I'm you. With the last question about the asynchronous and synchronous, uh, I just want to add to my answer that it is possible to communicate the presence of the teacher even asynchronously. No? So as long as a teacher responds to the discussion boards, that's also one way of being personable no? it, online. Now, regarding faith and values formation, um, as I said earlier, uh, it, it really depends on your philosophy. And if your philosophy is to teach the faith and values as facts, you will get into trouble because you are insisting that you are the only one correct, no? But if you are proposing that the teachings of scripture, for example, or, or values as judgments, you are inviting the students to think for themselves and to make their own judgments. No? Now, with regard to faith, I would be more careful uh, because obviously, uh, unless it's a religion class, uh, there's really no need to sort of uh, be in your face about your own faith. No? But I think as educators, our job as Christian educators, our job is to invite and challenge our students to, 
to make a personal judgment about their faith so that they will live their faith authentically, whatever that faith is, no? because you cannot impose on other people. Even if I believe, obviously, I'm a Catholic, I'm a priest. Obviously, I believe in my faith. I cannot impose on other people because, A, it's, a, it's not going to work. It just doesn't work that way. Nobody's going to accept it. No? Uh, but with regard to values, again, if we propose values as judgment, in other words, we have reason supporting why we feel these values are important. We're only inviting our students to make a similar judgment. You know? And we are not uh, imposing on them. So if the, if the parents complain and disagree with you, you can always say, I wasn't imposing the values as facts. I was proposing them as judgments. You know? So there, there is a way around that. I hope I answered your questions. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Go. Um, another question, uh, because you still have time, Dr. Go, is about, is there any experience in doing service learning with marginalized communities such as disabled people in trying to build or encourage the empathy of the students? So the question is, do I have an experience doing that? Yes. Yes, well, well I, I went through a similar uh, a program where I served for one month in an in a, um, orthopedic hospital for the poor. You know? so, and and uh, I was serving those who had spinal problems the whole month. So uh, I, I think working with people who are disabled is really a very powerful way to sort of nurse empathy, you know? for other people because uh, really you will, f you will begin to appreciate all the things we take for granted, no? like being able to move properly, being able to, to be independent and take care of ourselves, all these things that the many disabled people could not do when I was doing my service learning. So yes, that's a very effective way. But online, that would be a little bit problematic, I think, no? obviously. But you can also access stories of people who are disabled how they felt, what happened to them, and that can also create the, some kind of empathy. You know? yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go. Um, I would like now to uh, move to Dr. Eka because uh, we have questions very specific about uh, in trying to help the students in Sanata Dharma. This, is, this might be some example that the uh, person who asked this question asked for maybe an example. How to keep uh, your students' physical health when we have to learn, to learn from home during this global pandemic? And how a Sanata Dharma University facilitates students to learn well. So maybe you can respond to these uh, questions, Dr. Eka. Thank you for the question given to me. Uh, we just finished our service, uh, not for learning, but uh, Kaka and. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we just finished our kaka and uh, using an uh, online system. I mean, uh, self because, learning. Uh, yeah, service learning, sort of service learning. Uh, before pandemic, uh, this program is always uh, working uh, in a remote area. Uh, some students would go to a remote area, but due to pandemic, we cannot do that anymore. And therefore, we develop the so called uh, independent kaka and or independent service learning. Because the main point is not to have a remote area situation, but the most important thing is how to cultivate uh, compassion uh, from our student. And therefore, they are free to do many activities based on their own context. They have uh, many, uh, they may propose any, any related uh, activities as long as through this kind of activities, they can uh, develop their uh, compassion to the society. Now, regarding to the, uh, it works uh, because uh, uh, we, we just uh, finished the program. And regarding the, your question about how to make sure how to have our students uh, maintain or keep their heart 
uh, using an online environment, I think it depends on the way we design our online learning. Online learning uh, does not mean that every or all activity should be done using ICT. Online learning uh, can be uh, just a way of communication and many other activities, especially physical activities can also be introduced using online learning. So we may ask our students to do things like making a survey, doing things, uh, doing exercise and so on. And then they can report, our student can report to us by taking pictures or taking videos. So there are many possible things to do using an online platform. Uh, that's, uh, so that's why the design process, the design uh, aspect of online learning is very essential. If we don't have any uh, pandemic problem, then in our campus, we enforce our students to be actively uh, join some uh, uh, physical activities. So we provide a very good football field. We uh, develop our auditorium. We have many uh, places to, to gather, to have some uh, physical activities. And even in our whole person education program, where every student has a chance to, to be accompanied by their advisor for one year, we integrate the program with physical exercise activities like group dynamics, outbound, and visiting some interesting uh, places. Uh, yes, uh, as a Jesuit university, we have uh, enough and sufficient facilities to support uh, physical health and most importantly for me our concern to develop physical good physical environment is the most appropriate response to the digital life because one threat we have in digital life is physical health if our young student our our youngster our student are so enjoyable in using digital platform and there is a threat that their physical health is in danger, then we should develop the way our response is to develop our physical facilities like sport hall, a football field, in such a way these facilities is also very interesting to those our young student. And because we believe a good life should be the whole person life in many aspects, either physically, spiritually, and mentally. That's uh, my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eko. Exactly. Five minutes for both questions uh, response. Thank you. Now, um, Dr. Adit, there are some questions uh, for you too. Um, based on the survey from the students' voices, but also maybe uh, your uh, analysis and further uh, survey, if any. There are questions like this. What teachers should concern in order to sustain students' meaningful learning, retention, and motivation to learn? Is it better for teachers to allocate more time for lecturing and interactive sessions in the online class or only short lecturing time but expose them with materials, with reading um, materials, something like a flip learning with reading materials or assignments with various due dates, those questions and another if you have maybe some uh, result from the students' voices, the um, online platform, uh, which uh, may be low cost. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Regarding maybe about platform that is low cost, I think uh, in Indonesia, in especially in the Indonesian context, uh, certain carrier like Telkomsel, I believe, has uh, made it a free uh, access to access to your uh, university learning management system. 
So, but your university needs to register your IP address of the of your LMS server to Telkomsel, and then after it's registered, all the data access to the address will be free. It means that all the students who are accessing the LMS, in, in our case at Petra, we have registered our Lentera server to Telkomsel. That means that all access to Lentera either for downloading materials to uh, interact with in the forum uh, section or in, in doing the online quiz, all the data access is free. But I think that's, that's limited to the certain uh, carrier telecom cell. And only one server uh, can be registered to have this, uh, to enjoy this uh, free access for, for the data connection. That's, that's one. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a satisfying solution, but at least it's, it's part of the solution. And second, maybe not about this, which software is low cost or for in terms of data connection, because there are conflicting uh, information about which video conferencing software only generates uh, the least amount of data. Some say it's Zoom, but some say it's Google Meet, some say it's something else. So I, I'm, I'm not, a, uh, I mean, I'm not in, a, I don't have an expertise to judge that. So, but I think the way to, re, to the way to go is to reduce the amount of time for uh, synchronous online interactions, meaning reduce the time for video conferencing. This, this to help, uh, this solution is to help students with, with limited financial resources to buy the internet quota and stuff like that. Uh, maybe that's, that's part of the solution. And then the, the first question is about how to maintain a student's interest in, in learning. That's right. Maybe, yeah, uh, we are, we are, we as lecturers, because this is a mendadak daring or suddenly online, we don't have any prior experience. Everything is new for us. So many of us tend to just transport what we do in the physical world into the online world. Meaning if we have a two hour lectures on uh, physical classes, we also do uh, two hours uh, video conferencing. Well, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Okay, so in the in the in the in the early days of our uh, daring or on, suddenly online, uh, my my center pr proposed to the university rector to adopt a policy that if you have a two-hour uh, physical class lecture, it doesn't mean that you have to do two hours of video conferencing. You can supplement that with other uh, asynchronous activity, still online but asynchronous. Maybe as the students to read first, give some reading assignment, give students some uh, uh, discussion assignment that they have to discuss first, uh, so that they, they will spend time to discuss on the on the learning management software, for example. So those are the the kind of things that that you can do to sustain a student interest. So it's not the whole two or even three hours of uh, video conferencing, but you can uh, divide it into chunks, or you can use uh, many. There are many resources uh, with millennial generation right now. They are more visually oriented uh, uh, students, so use uh, visual resources, YouTube videos. There are so many uh, interesting things that you can find in YouTube videos. The, the only drawback is that most of them are in English. Yeah, but if if it's not a big problem, then it, it's a it's a wonderful resources. Or you can also do, uh, I, I mean, maybe just, uh, I just saw like some, uh, what you call, ice breaking uh, activities for Zoom or for video conferencing. So basically it's just to, it's just like ice breaking in the physical world, but this one in the, in the uh, online world. So maybe that's just uh, uh, touching on the surface, but at least uh, those are starters that you can do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Thank you for only touching the surface because there are questions that we didn't try to respond right now in the first uh, series because we, uh, we think and we suspect, we expect that the second uh, series will answer some deeper and maybe practical too uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think thank you very much for the three keynote speakers for responding to as many questions that we can get 
in such a limited time. Thank you too for all your questions, dear participants. And now for the last uh, agenda, but not least, of course, we are going to proceed with the closing remark from Dr. Hope S. Anthony, the Director of Faculty Development of the United Board for Christian Higher Education in Asia. Dr. Anthony, the time is yours for the closing remark. Hi, um, I would like to speak on behalf of my colleagues from the United Board. Um, for, I would like to congratulate and thank the team of the whole person education ambassadors who made this first part of the webinar series possible. It is very heartening to know that you continue to be committed to the philosophy, the principles, as well as the pedagogy of whole person education. And the very question that you have been asking since very early this year, how do we embed whole person education in on online teaching? It was already difficult during the face-to-face -face teaching. How much more is it challenging during the online teaching? I think uh, this speaks volumes, this question alone that you raised speaks volumes about your big commitment to this whole person education, philosophy, pedagogy, and principles. And so I think the United Board, everyone at the United Board would join me in saying thank you very much and congratulations on this first webinar. Um, I think I would just like to say also that uh, uh, affirming what these speakers have said, and we are grateful to, to Father Johnny, Dr. Eko, and Dr. Adi, who is also one of the WPEA alumni. Um, we, we were always uh, reminded during the, tra the training in Ateneo that we teach who we are. It's a quotation from Parker Palmer, but now the question is how do we communicate that presence? Uh, in the words of Father Johnny earlier, how do we communicate this presence as a teacher during the online teaching? And I think they have shown examples of how to show the, our empathy while building the empathy among the students, how to encourage student feedback regularly, how to be more mindful about how we design courses, um, make them short, but of higher quality. Um, no need to spend so much time, uh, you know, burdening students with, with long lectures or, or a lot of readings. I think we need to learn the, the technique of uh, putting important chunks of, of, of lessons uh, in our teaching um, and then always find ways to engage them. I think uh, these are uh, some of the reminders that we have received from, from our speakers. So uh, this is just the first part. So I think you will have to look forward to the second part where you will continue to learn more and have also chances to raise your questions. So thank you once again to everyone. All the best. Thank you, Dr. Antoni, for wrapping up all the topics of the day and also for encouraging and support us continuously. Now, this is the end, ladies and gentlemen, of the webinar series one. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you again in the second series next week. Wednesday, August the 12th, 2020 at 9 a.m. Western Indonesia time or 10 a.m. Manila, Hong Kong time. And here is your exit ticket uh, link to at the bottom uh, left side of the slide today. Again, I thank you all the keynote speakers, all the 
repre representatives of the UB CHEA and the participants and the committees. All on behalf of the committee, I say goodbye now, but see you again next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Welcome. Uh,